What's the difference between people who are able to overcome challenges, pick themselves up, and transcend difficult situation, and those who can't? Deep in the heart of Jewish thought is the belief that man is free to choose his own actions and create his destiny. On one hand, there are many modern philosophers and scientists telling us that we have no free will at all, and at the same time, other thinkers in our personal experience says something entirely different. Listen to what world-renowned psychiatrist and neurologist Dr. Viktor Frankl has to say. The decisive factor is decision, the freedom to, of choice, the freedom to come up with a decision. It should be, I would like to become this way or another in spite of conditions that should only seem to fully determine my behavior. At the moment, they can see a meaning in their suffering they can mold it into an achievement into a, they can mold their predicament into an accomplishment on the human level they can turn their tragedies into a personal triumph that was victor frankel a man who i've titled the father of positive psychology he applied the lessons he learned in the most extreme conditions imaginable, the Holocaust, and he codified a universal methodology which, in my opinion, did to psychology what Einstein did to physics. And now, live from Jerusalem, you're listening to Israel Inspired Radio. Here are your hosts, Rabbis Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Jeremy, I love that man. I, I wish I met him. I wish I met him personally because you hear in his voice the passion. He's lit up. He's living for a purpose. I mean, you could tell that he's literally living this message that he is sharing. And a big part of what he's saying is it's, it's about freedom. We, before the show, we were talking about this. Let me ask you, let's just start from here. Jeremy, what, what is freedom? Well, it's important to recognize that, you know, Dr. Viktor Frankl, he wasn't just a psychiatrist that you and I like. I mean, he was a revolutionary in his time. I mean, a, a, awards off the banner, 28 universities gave him honorary degrees. He brought in such a beautiful new concept into the field of science and psychology and psychiatry, but really he was bringing in a very Jewish idea that we can choose to find meaning in every situation. We can activate our own free will in order to create and not just react, that we can express freedom in the world. And I guess that's what you asked me, like what is freedom really? And I guess for me, freedom, and this is not intuitive, for me, freedom is connecting to my authentic self, transcending the not authentic, somehow connecting to what I guess I would describe as a soul and expressing that soul in the world. That when sounds I very esoteric, the, though. It's, it's okay, disconnecting from this and connecting to the soul, but how do you actually translate that to your life? How does that change day to day, moment to moment? Well, that's a really interesting idea. Let me, let me flush this out a little bit in order to bring it to everyday life. Okay. So let's look at the Torah. The Torah isn't just the story of the Jewish people leaving Mitzrayim. It's not just the Jewish people leaving Egypt, the Exodus that we're now reading in this upcoming week's Torah portion. It's really a blueprint for our own personal redemption and our own personal spiritual emotional growth that a slave inside Egypt, we're all slaves inside our own Egypt. And what is our Egypt? Our Egypt are just our impulses. It's the world acts upon us and we respond. I'm hungry now, I've been now stimulated in one way, I will now respond in another way. Real freedom is freeing myself from that response, which is not my authentic self, that's just myself responding to whatever is around me, transcending that and then connecting to what does my soul want in the world? What is good in the world? What is my ultimate aspirations? And when I'm able to then leave the responsive and then transform it into the creative, that's ultimate freedom. Does that make sense? <sighs> I, it makes sense. I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I would define it as impulses, you know, that, that you're trying to overcome. I think it's more of a paradigm. It's more of a prism through which you experience reality. And you could be in the same situation or circumstance and be either in a world of hell and sadness 
or a happiness and joy with the same circumstance going on with you in the world. Then what do you have Meaning, to do? Meaning, how do you see that? How do you see what you're going through? And a lot of means it is transcending the um, external. Hmm. Meaning, that there's a certain duality of the world that is very compelling that the world has this duality and we're all different and separate. But if you see a truth, if your life is pursuing the truth and being true to what you find, and that is your mission here in the world that gives you joy, then the circumstances don't matter. All that matters is that you're living with integrity to what you see is true in the world. Meaning certain people I know, and me to some degree also, define their self-worth or measure their self-worth based on external perspectives. So if you're really chashuv uh, and important and you're in the Knesset, then you're great. But if you fall out and you lose, then you're a loser. But if you know that your own internal compass for what is goodness and what to be proud of has nothing to do with what other people think or see. Hmm. That's what freedom is, to determine what yours is and live in truth to that. Well, let me take it to another level. We talk about Viktor Frankl. You know, he experienced life in three concentration camps, including Auschwitz. And so never mind what other people think about him. The man was living through ultimate hell on earth. And yet within that, he was able to derive meaning. He was able to overcome the challenges because instead of just responding to the hell that was around him because the natural response is you're in a tough spot i'm in a tough spot but if you're able to say ah i'm in a tough spot now objectively from the outside whatever that means i now need to look at this and with my own creative power through my own choice express that creative will which is in the power of my soul and transform the physical situation that's around me into something deeper, into something meaningful. And I think that it's not only, I mean, in many ways, the outer surroundings generate an impulse. And the natural impulse for a bad situation is to be sad. And it's the creative power, our ultimate freedom of free choice, to then choose to see that situation in a new light. And no one wants to see new, new situations in a new light. Why? Think about the Jews in Egypt, meaning that parallel goes all the way through. The Jews are like, no, no, no. Wherever I am now, I don't want to leave this comfort zone of the life that I could create. I'm living in this duality of life. It's comfortable for me. I see the. It's like the devil that I know. I'd prefer that than the freedom that I don't know. I would rather stay here in this situation. The slavery than, you know. Exactly, the slavery that I know than the freedom that I don't know. That's the slavery of the impulse on our spiritual quest. If we can somehow take the ideas of this the exodus of Egypt, I think, and then apply it to our own personal, emotional, psychological, spiritual growth, we would have an amazing insight into true happiness in the world. So I'll tell you what I disagree with about what you're saying, because you said it again, and there's something about the word that is alerting me, and I feel like you say, uh, overcoming the impulse. I don't feel like it's about overcoming the impulse. I feel like it's about fundamentally shifting the prism through which you see the world. And then the, the initial impulse isn't even an impulse anymore. That's not your impulse. The way you're doing it is it would be like a lifetime of battle, of fighting against something. You know, like when you're overcoming an impulse, it's not that you're overcoming an impulse. It's that you determine what is the win of your world. What is the win of this individual situation right now? That's why Viktor Frankl in his book, he talks about how uh, the one's m meaning in life is often so dynamic that it can change moment to moment. Your mission is something that can shift moment to moment, and that's why, as a Jew, we read the Torah, because the understanding of how God interacts with the world and the balance of different attributes, that sometimes a moment needs one to be strong and bold and courageous and sometimes compassionate and kind and merciful. Different moments need different attributes. So when we are able to learn the proper balance of these attributes, then those attributes are ultimately God's attributes we're trying to learn and we're able to come close to God through embodying his attributes in the world. I totally agree with what you're saying. I really do. But at the same time, I'm going to hold on to the impulse idea and let me tell you why. The reason why I think it's important to specifically categorize it as impulse is because the actions that we do in the world shape our priorities. The actions that we manifest in the world create the life that we have. Now, most people the impulse is to not do much, 
Meaning you have to decide to go out and exercise. You have to choose life. But what happens is that if you choose life enough and you get up and you exercise and then you get up the next morning and you exercise and the next morning and you exercise, by the fifth or sixth morning, you're just now exercising. Your actions that had to overcome a certain impulse of passivity have now created the opportunity for you to really live your ultimate life. But it, it, it was uh, an inherent challenge that you had to overcome to create that perfect life. Okay, so maybe what I could yield and say that different people need to approach it in different ways. Certain people need to fight an impulse, but certain people, I feel like, they, they're seeking a truth, and when they get that paradigm shift, that the truth of it is so overwhelming that it no longer becomes, you know, something that before was a punishment now becomes a reward that you're excited about. And you're actually able to jump out of bed in the morning and go work out, not because you have to fight against it every day and win through discipline. That's one way to do it, and it's a respectable way full of integrity. But another way could be for other people, perhaps, a paradigm shift that where they realize, oh, my goodness, this isn't something I have to do. This is the highlight of my day. Right. This exercise is the highlight of my day. I get to feel my body, breathe in air, see the sun, and they see all the elements of this, and they say, oh, my goodness, I'm dying to do that. And with the, the negative elements, let's say they were running before, and, and it was hurting, and they were cramping up, and they're like, I'm just going to go and do a relaxing jog, and I'm not ever going to push myself too hard. And then eventually they'll actually get in fantastic shape by just doing that. I'm saying it's, it could be a paradigm shift too. I hope we haven't gotten too off the... No, I think you're right. I mean, here's what Rav Soloveitchik says. I was studying this, uh, this essay called Shlichut, which doesn't really have a very good English translation. Messenger on a mission, someone that is here with a purpose. And in that essay, he talks about what it means to emulate God in his opinion, where I think most of Chazal, most of like Jewish sages throughout history have always said, well, you know, God is good and emulate God by being good. A God is kind, emulate God by being kind, emulate his ways in our own life. And it's usually love and kindness and compassion and justice. He says something relatively unique and he says, how do we emulate God in this world? The greatest way to draw closer to God by emulating him is by creating. When we create, we resemble God. Instead of being an object that we are thrust around, we become a subject that we start acting with. Instead of acting, you know, we're just reacting to whatever the world is, we then say, here is the world, let me do something to it. I want to now be a creative force within the world. And that is done through freedom as well. Meaning the freedom and free choice that we believe God bestowed onto humanity is part and parcel of Jewish theology in that I mean, it's brilliant that it connects to modern psychiatry as well. But what Viktor Frankl is really touching on is he's saying that our ability to choose the situation, our ability to choose the way we perceive the situation is inherently the, our greatest ability in many ways religiously to grow close to God. Just as God is a creative force in the world, when we exercise our free will, then we become godlike. And in so many times, I feel like this in my own personal life, that I am just a walking zombie. I'm going from meeting to meeting, waking up, going to sleep. I have work to do, deadlines to meet, articles to write, podcasts to prepare for. I'm running and shooting. And it's just like I'm being thrust around by my life. And there are few moments in life where I take life by the horns and I'm saying, all right, what am I doing now? What creative force do I want to impart in on the world and when i do that i leave the shackles of the slavery of being thrust around this world and i choose real freedom okay well you know there's a uh, story that victor frankel tells in his book where he really outlines the principles of logotherapy his special therapy that he developed and, and determined and wrote books about and logotherapy to me is another is let's say you know how the kabbalah is the esoteric or mystical uh, prism of Judaism, I would say logotherapy is the psychological prism of Judaism. Hmm. The prism of Judaism through psychology is logotherapy. Interesting. Because logo mean is, means meaning. 
right? And it's a therapy of making meaning out of what you're going through. And the story that stood out in my mind as the most pronounced was uh, a, a man that went to visit him, and he was, his wife had died two years before. They'd been married over 50 years. The love of each other, this man was a doctor, and he loved his wife so much, and he'd been in a deep depression for the two years that since his wife passed away. And Viktor Frankl asked him just a few questions. He said, let's say that your wife were to be alive and you were to die when she died. How would she be feeling right now? The man said she would be just as miserable and sad and depressed as I am now. And Viktor Frankl said, well, then you're saving her that pain. What you're going through, you're doing it instead of what she, her having to go through that. You've saved her so much sadness and pain. And the man was able to leave there with some sort of smile on his face for the first time because now his pain had meaning. Purpose. Purpose. Mm. Meaning. That's what it's really all about. I get Freedom is when you're able to take your life and say, what is my meaning? What is my meaning in this life? And my mission is to fulfill that meaning. And when you know it's a good meaning, when it's not outcome oriented. It's not about achieving this or achieving that. It's about living with a certain way and a certain truth that is inherently on the journey itself fulfilling. So that means that every scenario that you're in, the win of that scenario has nothing to do with the outcomes of it. It has to do just with the way you are experiencing and interact with it. That's the win. Well, let me take you what you're saying to a, 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 a new direction in that I agree with everything that you said and hear it like this. I see someone hungry on the street. Now, if I'm not worried about outcomes, then why would I give him food? But, of course I'm drawn to give him food because it's a love of act and kindness. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. He's poor and I want to help him. The brilliance of the prophets of Israel, according to Abraham Joshua Heschel, is that the prophet was able to hold man and God in one thought. But what does that mean, according to what you just said, is that as he's giving food to the poor person, it's just as important to not do it for the outcome. It's not only for the outcome, it's to be able to see man and God and the purpose and the meaning behind it at the same moment. That on one hand, you are making a creative act in the world. On one hand, you are giving money to that poor person. You are uh, educating the new people that you are now speaking to. But at the same time, that act and expression is in another way meaningful in and of itself. That somehow the prophets were able to, through human suffering, through human needs, their heart called out in a way that expressed God's true desire for him to act in the world. Does that make sense? Viktor Frankl's psychological reality is a consequence or in the same wavelength as Einstein's paradigm shift that energy equals matter. When we realize that all of, of matter around us, everything that we think is stuff is just energy and all there is in the universe is energy. That's what E equals MC squared actually means. Then we realize that God is everywhere. Ain od mil vado. There's nothing but God anywhere in the world. It doesn't mean that everything is God, but everything is a manifestation in some distinct way of godliness. So when we realize that, then we say even the men around us, the people around us, they are God. They are being animated by God. They have a piece of God within them. And when you see that, then you understand that everybody's around us is being orchestrated in that way. And you can act with loving compassion, knowing that behind all these people is really God there. And we can, that's, that was, I think, the Abrahamic breakthrough of treating his guests with the knowledge that within them was a spark of the God of all of humanity. Right. I guess what I'm a little bit concerned with, and this is what I wanted to hash out with you, is that when you say that outcomes are not important, but on the other end, Abraham really wanted for that experience with those three people that came and visited him at his end, he wanted to give them a very good experience. He wanted the outcome, and I think that's critical not to lose. Well, I'm, when I say not outcome-oriented, the message that I'm trying to convey is not the outcomes that we are used to experiencing in this world. Oh, what are the outcomes Meaning we're looking for? the outcomes for? of like, you go into a meeting with your boss. You, you, it's so important. You, your win here is that the outcome is that you get a raise. Okay, I'm saying that that's not the outcome anymore. The outcome of a meeting is not to get a, the outcome of a meeting is to 
while you may want to get a raise and pitch your cause, but the outcome is your win is if you act with integrity and truth and self-respect and respect for your boss and you have the attributes that you believe are the attributes that you need to have in this world. That's your win. The secondary win, but that's the primary win, that is, the is primary not win. about what comes out of the meeting. Indeed. is not about achieving that. That's amazing. So, so when you... Uh, uh, Choose your outcome. So Abraham said, what is my outcome that I want? I want these people to feel loved and to feel respected and to feel like there's an element of them that's being addressed deep within them that they didn't even know existed, that there's a soul in there, that they are a soul, and they didn't even realize that. Hmm. That's what I think Abraham was much more than a, you know, intellectual compelling argument he made. I don't think he talked about monotheism, and I don't think he taught so much. I think he integrated into himself what the what that that understanding that everyone is god and acted in such a way where it was self-evident and that was the real inspiration yeah i think you're right i think that the more you act with that level of consciousness the more that level of consciousness becomes an integral part of your life because that's all meaning you have to see beyond this world to see the sublime that it's hinting to and that's critical but your actions like we said earlier create your priorities meaning if you're at a meeting with your boss and you start scheduling meetings over your own health and over your own family then what you've done in your own life is through your own actions you've now distorted your own priorities but the more you act with the truth and meaning and integrity that you've created in your own life and you exercise your will and your freedom to choose to go into that meeting with that eyes, with that goal, that's when you come closest to Hashem. And I think that ultimately, Judaism is really all about changing ourselves. You know, there's that, there's, I, I don't know who, who said this quote, I should probably look it up, but uh, I said, you know, I wanted to change the world, but then I got older and I said, you know what, I'm just going to change my country. All right, I was going to change my country, but I see I can only change my state. No, nah, state, never mind, just my city, just my town, just my neighborhood. Oh my gosh, just my family. Oi, I woke up and I realized, really, I have to change myself. And that is the ultimate goal. Meaning when the outcome of every situation is, how can I change myself? How can my prayers change myself? How can each interaction I have with the individuals bring me to a higher level of existence? Um, then we're on the Jewish journey. Right. Well, so I'll just wind it down here. And I'll say when you're talking about priorities, if you have certain priorities and then you see it's coming at the expense of your health and your this, why would you allow your work to come at the expense of your family? Why would you allow your work to come at the expense of your health? The only reason is because you've made an idol out of work. Uh, somehow work has become this important, important thing that will determine your welfare, the welfare of your family, and it is within work that your salvation lies. And you've it, literally handed the keys of your life over to work and made it into an idol. But if you live intentionally, if you say from scratch, what are my priorities in life, and I'm going to schedule my life that way, and if there's a conflict, my priorities are this, this, and this, then your work will fall in, even if it means that you're bringing in less money than you think. But you know what would probably happen? If you scheduled your, your family and your health first, you would say, well, how can I become more efficient? Because you're operating at such a higher level. Your brain is at a higher level. Your self-respect is at a higher level. You are a higher level person, which then says, well, how do I delegate this stuff out? How do I become more efficient? And you're someone that's able to be putting less in on the work front and actually getting more, but it's only after you've truly internalized making your priorities a part of your living with intention. That's what it is. And so when you leave Egypt, really, what is that slavery? It's to all of the idols that we create in our own life. We become slaves to those idols, whatever they might be. It may be your boss. It may be your work. Those idols, they start controlling us. And I think that the ultimate Jewish journey is to free ourselves from that slavery and choose within our own free will on the meaning and purpose that we find for ourselves. This is Jeremy Gimpel and Aria Bramwitz. Thank you all so much for being with us. We'll see you next week.